he should be live, but I don't see him. Okay, we are live. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, this is Steve Sabadaski. I'm publisher of ValueBuzz.com, attorney, and uh, I'm now uh, co-chairing this program with my good friend Jay Bat, and we have Lauren Hardy on uh, on our program today. And it's been a, a day from hell, to be honest with you, uh, uh, for so many different reasons. But let me just uh, do a quick intro uh, to uh, Jay. Jay is, uh, as, as you guys know, is a former uh, city council person. He's uh, he's in so many, he's president of so many different organizations, or vice president, or chairperson. Uh, the Sugar Bowl, just being one. Uh, I think he's vice chair of the Republic, uh, Louisiana Republican Party. I have a whole list, but I just can't get to it right now. Um, also, uh, he's a uh, owner of, or uh, a owner of franchise of, um, of, uh, of different retail, uh, outlets like Lily Pulitzer and, uh, uh, Jay, go ahead and you take over, tell us what, what you've been doing and, um, uh, and then we'll get to Lawrence. Go ahead. Well, when I, uh, <clears throat> stepped away from politics, I didn't really step that far. And I'm involved on the local and the state level. And um, we just like to see our state and our city do well. So I've stayed engaged. I most recently was president of uh, City Park, and we just established the City Park Conservancy. I've been involved with the Sugar Bowl, Crime Stoppers, uh, to name a few. Um, the franchises you were referring to, Lily Pulitzer, Joseph Bank, Roos Chris, and I developed real estate. And I've done that through the South. And recently, I got my Louisiana real estate license um, because my partner did. And I decided I was going to do it as well. And I'm uh, focusing on uh, commercial and residential real estate. I'm with Engels and Velker. Oh, great, great. Okay, so those people who are watching, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, please go ahead and hit share. Uh, another thing is that we're going to be looking at your uh, comments or questions, if you have any. And uh, go ahead and uh, make your comments because we'd love to hear from you. Uh, hit share and make your comments or ask your questions. We'll post them. Um, so go ahead, uh, Jay. Ask the magic question if you don't mind. Well, first of all, I want to welcome uh, Lawrence Shahardi, who, quite frankly, uh, is a legend in politics in our state of Louisiana. One of the really good guys out there who has been in it for all the right reasons and done a yeoman's job for years and years and years. Um, Tommy Capella told me when he took the position after you, uh, Mr. Shardy, and I'm like, do you mind if I call you Lawrence? We've known each other for years. I'd much rather you call me Lawrence. Okay. Yes. All righty. Um, told me what, what a fine uh, office he took over uh, when you stepped aside. Uh, so it is a real privilege to have you here this evening. The question I was just going to ask well, you to explain to some of the people out there who don't know exactly what is the role. I, I know what it is. I know Stephen does. The role of the commission. Um, in terms of assisting uh, residents and citizens of our good state? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am chairman of the Louisiana. Uh, uh, our function is to supervise the parish assessors, in contact with the public, the deal of property. Property tax, for example, your local assessor, let's say at 100, uh, you think that it's not worth something less than that. Local assessor, so you try to work it out. You then go to what's called, which is the governing authority of the Portland City Council, the Jefferson Park would be the local boards of review. And the other parishes. Uh, relief is given there. The tax commission, and we hear your staff appraises who go up, and we, we take evidence. 
just like it's uh, much more. Um, most people don't have legal representative. They, they and uh, present their their mission hears it and makes a rule the property. And uh, is what is what we do responsible for valuing property. And that would be Peter's example or 18 of those properties. And that's what we do. Uh, but most is in a supervisory role. Yes, I think that sums it up pretty well. One of the things that I enjoyed, well, not so much enjoyed on the city council, is that when the uh, local assessor came um, and, and gave people their tax uh, bills, they could appeal it to the city council. That's um, correct. And, and then after that piece, it went to you guys. Um, and it seemed like we could never make anybody happy, no matter what happens. <laughs> in most places, you know, uh, the old saying is, "Nobody happy you are." That's you right. Did you know? <laughs> get it right. So look, you know. Look, look. Uh, let me ask you a question, if you don't mind, uh, Lawrence uh, and Jay, please uh, chime in here. Uh, talking about real estate and uh, economic development, how, do, how does, say, like the tax commission, does it have any impact upon, uh, say, uh, the economic development of the state of Louisiana? Um, certainly you know, the assessor's office. And Jay, um, from your perspective, um, you know, how, I mean, what do you think that maybe the state of Louisiana can do to help drive the economic development from your, your perspective of, of an owner of retail stores, uh, real estate owners, et cetera? Lawrence, go ahead, please. Well, the tax commission doesn't have, have any direct responsibilities in regard. What we do have to make sure that, that is, is fairly uh, whether it be a, a home business or, or a large, large industry, over tax and over value. I do believe that you uh, tax yourself to the point industry and business competitive and too expensive. Uh, we, we don't want to have that happen. You know, for many, many homeowners, it sends me particularly in this day, we have inflation and then sometime next year. So uh, uh, everybody is trying properly uh, so that, that it is not, not excessive people can afford. Jay. Well, I, I, the way our companies have been treated has been extremely fair. Uh, and quite frankly, when we've uh, integrated our efforts with other companies, um, not necessarily in the same uh, field, i.e. retail and or uh, restaurants or whatever, uh, I've never really heard any comments that have been critical of the Louisiana Tax Commission. Um, they may strike people as odd, but it, but it's the truth. Uh, it's it's The issue is comes is how the money is spent once it gets collected and it's been put forth to the state. It hasn't been the the, um, the way in which the, the properties have been assessed necessarily and the amount of, that the fees that have been charged accordingly. I, I feel that uh, they do a pretty darn good job, quite frankly. Uh, on the local level though, however, uh, there's a lot more griping that goes on about the way in which, um, and I'm gonna bring up an issue, the way in which taxes are assessed. Uh, and that is, um, and this comes, uh, Lawrence, from when I was talking to Tommy, Capella, the assessor out in JP, um, a few years ago, and we were in his office and we we're talking about different things. And he pointed out something to me that I had no idea. And that was the tax base in Jefferson Parish is significantly higher than that of Orleans Parish. And I said, how can that be given the buildings that are downtown or what have you? And he told me the exemptions that a lot of these companies, nonprofits get, and that so the parish of Orleans cannot collect taxes against. And uh, I'm sure you dealt with that in Jefferson Parish, of course, and you see it. And quite frankly, Stephen, when, when you are trying to build an economy, 
when you try to take care of the, you know, blocking and tackling of what goes on for a parish and, and a state, you need to be equal, even handed, if you will, and taxed. And in some cases, um, that's not the case by exemptions that are, are doled out to certain groups. And I think that's one thing I personally, and I think I speak for a lot of others, Lawrence, would like to see that reviewed, if you will. And I know that's not in your wheelhouse, but I, you know exactly what I'm referring to and talking about. Exactly what you're talking about. And unfortunately or unfortunately, it's perspective, uh, but in role is uh, when it comes to status, whether someone said exemption or, or uh, a financial or religious entity isn't that's not something that the has authority over. Ask me, you know, what the question ought to be uh, is to uh, be that the tax commission have all of the issues. Uh, a better thing uh, for actually right now uh, over what's called legal matters is legal matters. Let, let me interrupt and just say that um, I want to ad address this. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, basically, we're, we're having some audio problems with La uh, Lauren Shahardi. Uh, we've already we've had a couple of people uh, here. Here's a comment here. Uh, please ask uh, Mr. Shahardi to check his earbud connection. His audio is not uh, clear, uh, spotty. You know, it's funny because um, Lawrence and I were talking earlier today, and uh, you know, and, and the thing is, it was working fine for some reason. You know, a few minutes before we went live, bam, it, uh, they had a problem. So, Lawrence, I'm not sure what we can do. Uh, and uh, here's another one from um, Ann Ashby Gary and. Thank you, Lisa. I agree. Thought it was my connection. Uh, I think it's, I think it's an internet connection issue. Uh, but it could be, it could be a microphone, your microphone. It could be earbuds. Um, I don't know what else to tell you at this point, Lawrence. Well, I tried earlier uh, earbuds, and the the the, the uh, program to get it. Up. Out of mute, so uh, I could try it again, but I make uh, so uh, I can do whatever you want, you know, whatever you want. Okay, so um, uh, how about this? Uh, I think that probably at this point in time, it, it might be better if uh, uh, we have you back on at another time. When the uh, when we have your uh, hearing ear earbud issue taken care of, uh, you know, I, I think that's probably the best thing. Uh, I, I thank you though, I really do. I re really thank you. And so uh, Jay and I are just going to have a chat, Lawrence. Thank you, and uh, maybe we can do it next week. One one last comment I'd like to make before you sign off, Lawrence. I just got a note saying that you have a face for TV and I have a face for radio, so. You take care, my friend. Good to see you. Okay. So there it is. Uh, so it's Jay, it's you and me. Um, yeah, Lawrence is really an incredible guy. I mean, really, we've done so many different shows together in the past. Uh, I mean, really, before he became the tax commissioner. Um, and, you know, it's funny because he's tax commissioner uh, under a Democrat governor. Right. Who, who appointed him. And, you know, Stephen, he's the definition, in my opinion, and I've just like you've got to know a lot of people through politics. He is a true public servant and has done a remarkable job. He has an extremely successful uh, law firm. Uh, he doesn't need the job. Uh, he, he does it because he cares and he knows it and he wants to help. And that's what a public servant should be. 
and uh, he, he really defines it well. And, and we're lucky to have him in our state. Uh, absolutely. And, he's, and he really is such, such a uh, really nice guy. So again, uh, those people watching, please go ahead. We want to hear from you. We're going to be talking. I'm going to be asking Jay <clears throat> some questions uh, about his business, if you don't mind. I, I think a lot of people would like to know. Uh, I thought people want to hear about Tulane football. Uh, well, go ahead. I mean, they're what? They're, they're five and one, is it? And homecomings this weekend. Uh, they're already bowl eligible. That doesn't happen that often in Tulane's, uh, you know, to, to Tulane very often. So a lot of people are very excited. A lot of people are coming in for homecoming. Uptown New Orleans at 2.30 in the afternoon at kickoff. It's going to be rocking. And it's kind of fun. I know I know, we're, the Saints are, are a little off right now and LSU's are up and down. But at least we have the green wave for us this year. Okay, so this year, this year you're the president of the Sugar, the All State Sugar Bowl. No, uh, no, I'm, I'm I'm a past president. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and your term was up when? Uh, that was about ten years ago. Okay, so what? So what? I'm sorry. What's your position there now, Kurt? Uh, I'm I'm a uh, past president, and uh, okay. I'm still very involved. We're still on the committee. Um, the Sugar Bowl has the smallest uh, volunteer membership of any of the bowls uh, in the United States of America. And we have the smallest staff. Um, for us to compete with the Fiesta and the Cotton and the Orange and stuff, those, those cities have Fortune 500 companies that underwrite a lot of things. Their state, for instance, in tax, Texas and Florida, they have funds that, that create special event funds that they collect the tax revenue that go into it and then they reinvest it and hand it to those uh, organizations like the Sugar Bowl that can use it as, uh, you know, monies in order to attract, for instance, a national championship game. To get a national championship game in football, college football now, is $15 million. Other states have resources and funds to assist uh, those organizations, so for instance, a Cotton Bowl, to go out and bid on it. They get assist from the city, from the state, and from the corporations, the Fortune 500s. New Orleans has Entergy, and Rod West is a phenomenal man, but they can't, everybody calls on them, and they're very generous. Um, but we, we don't have the state to write us a check to help co-op that. We don't have the city um, to take money and then give us money to go ahead and bid on a national championship game. So we kind of do it ourselves. And, and when we have good games, for instance, and good matchups, we save our money, we spend it wisely, we don't... Uh, our per diem, for instance, per day is, is $60 when we travel. Now, think about that in today's world. Not a lot. No, but no. we were able to compete with the big boys because we run a tight ship. And we got a great leadership at the top. So we have a couple of people here that, that said go wave. Uh, we have Lisa O'Dwyer. She used to run the athletic department behind the scenes for years and years and years. Is that right? Yes, indeed. And uh, Sam's, is the same as uh, you? Pardon me? And also, we have another comment here. Uh, is it Sims Hughes? Sims Hughes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you a question. Uh, I, th I think uh, I saw something in the paper just uh, maybe yesterday or something. Why? I mean, is it possible that you know of that Tulane and LSU can start playing there? I mean, their game, those games were absolutely terrific. And You're I absolutely just, correct. I mean, really. I mean, look. I've seen three 62 to nothing games. I mean, live. I was there. And I'm a Tulane fan. Right. And uh, I, I, I went uh, ape when uh, I think Tulane beat LSU 17 nothing, I believe it was, uh, after 30 years or so. But what, I mean, what in the heck is going on? What, why in the world did we lose out on that? And, and do you know if there's any chance that we can get it back together? Um, I, I was part of some discussions a while back when we had uh, Johnny Hankel, the senator, and some others, uh, like-minded folks that wanted to get back on track. Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember the wheelbarrow Norby races uptown New Orleans, and the uh, loser would have to push the winner in a wheelbarrow with beer around the block. Uh, lots of fun. It, it became, unfortunately, college football is all about dollars now. And it, it, we saw this come in the last 15 or 20 years. And there's just any dollars for LSU. The money would be made by Tulane if they were to play LSU. But LSU wants to play somebody of, of more consequence that they can, you know, get the TV money and all the other 
parts of the equation that add to their war chest. Uh, playing Tulane does not do that for a school like LSU or Notre Dame. You know, but Tulane, yeah. unfortunately, is the one that gets called up and might be considered a patsy and gets a big payday for playing like an Alabama or Texas. So let's see, we, we have a comment here. Let me show it. Um, uh, Bill uh, Dodenhoff says SEC expansion costs Tulane. Yep. That's pretty reasonable, yes. Mm-hmm. Tulane, well, if you might remember, in the, Tulane was a member of the SEC years ago, about 50, 60 years ago. Uh, oh they, wait, they, wait, wait. Uh, I, I think they stopped being that what, in, the, in the 80s or 90s, is it? No, no, they weren't in the SEC, the Southeastern Conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tulane, Tulane uh, left the SEC back in, in the late 60s or early 70s. I think it was the late 60s. Wow. The Vanderbilt was, stayed in. Yeah. The checks that the SEC members, for SEC members that aren't that good at the sport of football, like a Vanderbilt, I'm sorry, Vanderbilt, you know, Commodore fans, but it's true. They get royalty checks for being part of the SEC, which are astronomical. Tulane would do very well if they were to have that, but they chose to exit. The board chose to exit the SEC. They should have stayed in. And by expanding, and and the SEC expanding right now, uh, it kind of unfortunately put some of the teams that are uh, middle of the pack on on the uh, back burner right now. So we have a comment here from Beverly Rose Lamb who said that Tulane dropped out of SEC what year? So uh, you're saying it was a, um, I don't remember the exact year, but I believe it was the late sixties, Beverly. I okay. believe so. Uh, if anybody can go ahead and check that out and uh, put it on, uh, on the uh, chat here and we'll post it. Uh, I, I think it was after that. Uh, I think it was, I think Ben, ben Ellinger was one about he beat LSU in 73, if I'm not mistaken. Was, Benny was Elder was the coach, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, was, we weren't in the SEC. Tulane was not in the SEC then, and that was in okay. 73. Okay, okay. By the way, uh, let me just throw this in for my – I sure. attended Swanee for a couple of years, the University of the South. They were the mythical national champions of 1899 and charter members of the SEC. But the last team to beat Alabama by more than 50 points – was back in 1907 by the Swanee Tigers. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, and, and let me throw this out to you. Uh, Lisa uh, O'Guire says, who's replying to the uh, question by Beverly Rose Lamb, June 1966. I tell you what. I, I was I, close. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I, I really thought that. I, I mean, I was a big, big Tulane fan. I mean, I really – uh, uh, Abercrombie, uh, Duhon, uh, but anyway, it's, it's gone with the wind. Thank you, Lisa right. Dwyer, for that information. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, we have another comment here, uh, from Bailey Elizabeth. Uh, last year was 1966. Uh, I think we have another comment here, Georgia. Georgia Tech dropped out too. That's right. Uh, that's right. I, I, you know, they had, I think, what, eight teams? I think it was Georgia Tech, Tulane, uh, Kentucky, LSU, Mississippi, Ole Miss. Alabama. Alabama. And Florida. Right. The Mississippi I think was initially. Yeah. Now, since you brought up Georgia Tech, Beverly, um, I thought I'd share something amusing. Yeah. So this past weekend, I, w- I traveled for the Sugar Bowl. I was at the – Tennessee Alabama game, which was spectacular in Knoxville. Lo and behold, um, the assistant AD at Alabama was tapped to be the new AD at Georgia Tech, the head man. And he and I had heard about each other for the last five years. And, and why? Because his name is Jay Bat. So I got to meet him in, in the uh, suite with some guys this past weekend. And we just told some funny stories that, and stories that we had heard about each other. <laughs> That's that's really amazing. Uh, There's no other J bats around. That's that's kind of like bat to bat, huh? That's <laughs> so. Look, we have Rufus Harris uh, says uh, according to uh, Semi Hill Hughes, Rufus Harris was a president that pulls us out of the SEC. Do you remember that? Oh, so I was a youngster. I do not. 
I was six years old in 66. I'll be gone. I'll, I'll be gone. Uh, so here's another comment. Um, uh, Beverly Rose Lamb says, Tennessee, I'm a graduate and loving us beating Alabama. Boy, they, they whooped them, huh? Well, it was, they didn't whoop them. It was 53 to 50 was the score. And they won on a last second kick. But I got to tell you, the campus was electrifying and the whole day. The uh, tailgates were spectacular. The weather was perfect. And uh, it was a wonderful part of college football. That's what makes college football so unique is the days like that. Absolutely. Uh, you went to the game? I was at the game. It, w it was wonderful. We did the tailgating, the whole thing, and enjoy the uh, festivities after the game. Watched them tear down the goalposts and throw them to the Tennessee River. In, in, yeah, in, any chance that Tulane might get back? <laughs> uh, let me tell you, Tulane, if, if they went out, they're going to be chosen to be in a pretty decent bo you know, uh, bowl game, and that'll be very thrilling. The one thing Tulane fans need to do so they'll be uh, more favorable when there's, uh, the selection process comes about is show their support for the team and travel and fill those stands up wherever they may go. That's one of the things the Bulls look at is what teams travel well and who's going to come to their game. And I tell you what, if Tennessee were to come to the Sugar Bowl this year, I would imagine they would uh, fill up our stadium, the Superdome, pretty darn well. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, let me just give a plug. Next, next Tuesday, we're doing our second show, um, and we have Mark Romick and Vince Vance. So that's going to be a great combination. Nice. Uh, Mark's a Sugar Bowler, by the way. Uh, I'm sorry. Was his, Mark's a sugar bowler as well. His dad was, and so is his brother Jay. That's, that's really amazing. Uh, uh, we're going to have Michael Heck back. Uh, Michael was scheduled for today, but unfortunately he had a, uh, an event that he had to go to. Some, some people had come in town. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have, um, uh, please help me if, if you may, uh, uh, we, we have a number of people all lined up, uh, I, I can tell you. So uh, everybody check their, their schedule for Tuesday. Make sure it's Tuesday 7 uh, to 7.30 and 7.30 to 8. It's going to be a regular thing. We can't wait uh, to have it. Uh, some of these people. Uh, we have, uh, it says uh, Beverly Rose Lamb, uh, again, said, Tennessee, I'm a graduate and loving us beating Alabama. So uh, changing gears for a second, if you don't mind, and, and that is, um, let me, uh, again, anybody have a question, please go ahead and qu uh, post a question, a comment, post your, your comment. Uh, shifting gears for a second, um, we have an election coming up, and I don't want to talk politics too much at all. Uh, you're the uh, uh, vice chair of the Louisiana Republican Party. How's it work? Well, as I told uh, my friends that I was going to stay away from politics on this on this podcast. Right. But, you know, I, I just want to see good people get elected that want to work and make our market, our city, our parishes and our state better. And quite frankly, if you have a D behind your name and you do the job, I'm all for you. Um, I, I just want to see New Orleans and the rest of the cities in the state and our state flourish. The uh, bottom line is we're all Louisianians. In this area, we're all New, New Orleanians. And the bottom line is we're pulling on the same rope we need to pull together. And if we do that, we will do well. If we don't and we divide ourselves by whether we're black or white or Republicans or Democrats, we're not going to get anywhere. And stagnation is going gonna, is gonna to be the doom of us. So uh, that's what I would suggest. I'd encourage everybody to vote, especially in the judicial races, because that's really what affects your quality of life with crime. I've been involved with Crime Stoppers since the 90s. And what we see that, that the public doesn't necessarily see on what's going on in the repetitive uh, crimes that are being committed by the same folks, it's really, really scary what's happening, the revolving door. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we have judges that are release uh, people that have been charged with crimes that have been convicted of crimes uh, on ROIs, which is, you know, they're responsible for themselves for, for let, lack of a better expression. Uh, and we need to make sure that the judges are in place that go ahead and um, give out sentences and, and, you know, bail, if you will, uh, set a bail high enough. If you 
commit, you know, a uh, heinous crime, especially a violent felony of sorts. Those are the ones that concern me the most um, in our markets. So, and that's the, by the way, Stephen, for most people who don't know, that's the lowest turnout for elections is judicial races. And voting for those, and do your homework, look them up, see how they're done and in, in, in what their background is, check out their bio and, and vote accordingly. If we get the right people in, that's all that matters. So we have a, a, an appeals court race, am I, am I correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. So shifting gears again, if you don't mind. Are you talking, about the, are you talking about the Fourth Circuit? Yeah. So all right. We have, yeah. We have Here, a here's a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it out there, Stephen. Um, here's a perfect example. I was a, uh, one of the three, four people that got Joseph Gow to run against Bill Jefferson about a decade ago. Um, and uh, he went to Congress. He got defeated by Cedric Richmond, who's a friend, uh, when uh, his term came up. And he's running for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal for, against Karen Herman. And I'm a Republican, local, state. I hold titles, offices. Bottom line is I'm supporting Karen Herman. Why? Because she's been a great criminal court judge. I know her personally. She's good people. And she'll do a great jo job on the Fourth Circuit. I'm not vo voting with who the party endorsed. I'm going who I think will do the best job. Just, uh, just out of curiosity, a generic question about politics, and that is that, you know, what type of, uh, what type of, say, control, monopoly do the parties have, influence, uh, you, you pick your word, uh, what kind of control do they have upon the party members uh, to to vote the way they want the members to vote. Not a lot of control, yeah. but we encourage them to vote with the endorsed slate that we have because in most cases, I think we try to, um, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm conservative in my thinking, especially on fiscal issues. I, I quite frankly, I don't know what the Dems and the Republicans have done fiscally because they've gone nuts with spending money, but, um, but socially, I'm left of center, but all we can do is suggest and, and who to support. Um, and we just go, but we'd suggest people also go with their conscience. If they have personal relationships with people or, or uh, familial relationships, then support them. Um, we had supported the Republican Party of New Orleans when I was chairman. Uh, we we uh, endorsed Desiree Charbonnet for mayor the first go round. And the second one, we, um, who was it? Uh, the judge, uh, help me out, Steve, and I'm forgetting his name right now. Michael, um, uh, you remember? Yeah, no, Michael no. Bagnaris. We supported him in, in the, um, and lo, lo and it, it didn't work out. Um, and here we are. We can't cry over spilt milk. We just gotta pick, us, pick ourselves back up and get a candidate out there that can go ahead and turn this thing around and uh, try to put more cops on the streets and find the funding to do more, have more police officers and take care of that. But let's shift it off of politics. Let's go to something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, I was going to ask you about City Park. Oh, sure. You're very, yeah, you're very involved with City Park. Um, so what's going on with that? All right, here's a uh, sponsor thing. My brother had these Travis tumblers made for the 300th anniversary of our city. All right, that's it for Brian. I love my brother. Um, uh, okay. City Park, exciting. Exciting things are happening at City Park. I just rolled off of being president. Uh, we established in the last 18 months uh, CPC, which is a City Park Conservancy. Uh, what that is, it allows us to function like uh, Central Park, like Balboa Park in San Diego, like some of the great parks in our, our, in our country, uh, Memorial Park in Houston. And it's gonna allow City Park to do some things that we haven't been able to do because we've been a quasi-state agency uh, since its inception over 150 years ago. And with that, we're going to be able to put a lot of concepts and ideas that uh, folks have had and suggested that we haven't been able to do uh, into play. We're going to be able to expand. Uh, we're going to develop, uh, develop cautiously and in a, in a conservative way, especially protecting the green space. When I, I didn't want anybody to get worried about when you say develop, they think high rise. No, no, no. But, but some of the space that's already there and repurpose it and do it in a, a responsible way. And that's what the CPC is going to allow. 
for the children and the communities in our area. Um, we found, especially during COVID, that the uh, popularity of City Park and the people who attended City Park, uh, were, they were so excited to get out because you had areas, green space. And we're one of the largest parks in acreage. We're all 1,400 acres in the United States. And we're smack dab in the middle of the city. Uh, and it allows us to think a little bit outside the box because we cater to so many different uh, people and families in our market. And that's not just New Orleans, even though it's called City Park. We, we are a region, North Shore, Jefferson Parish, St. Charles Parish, uh, Plaquemines, all, all come and use the park. And if, if, if I'm not mistaken, we have close to seven or eight million visitors a year, which is quite astounding when you think about it. So we're going to be doing that. And that's one of the things I'm very proud that we did that. The legislation had, we had to be done at the state level and the legislation had already been approved uh, almost 25 years ago. The park and the commission and the board just never acted on it. Now we have, and it's in play. So big things are going to be fun to watch city park. You're pretty busy, huh? I try to stay busy, but uh, I've got two beautiful daughters that I like to uh, connect with. One's up in D.C. and works as a graphic designer. And Bailey, who helps me with my technology, who's been spectacular, Steve, that you've interacted with. She's a life, uh, she's a child life specialist at Children's Hospital here in New Orleans. So we get a chance to be with her a lot. And it's, so it's wonderful. You know, you have children, too. And I've got a beautiful wife, Andre, that puts up with all my shenanigans all these years. So and we just celebrated 27 years of marriage. So um, I appreciate her putting up with me. So one one last set of questions um, that, that I have, I, I know we don't want to go over time, but I do want to ask you about the retail business. Actually, I wanted to ask you about the real estate business. The what? So, the real estate business. OK, sure. OK, yeah. Why, why don't you tell us about that? So so you're a a real estate, a commercial real estate advisor. Correct. Counselor. And, and residential, too. But um, just to back up, I'll just share with you. So years ago, I worked for the original FNBC, First National Bank of Commerce. And I was in charge of director's debt. And I, Sidney Bestoff was on our board. Well, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, thereabouts, um, Joseph Bank, and I was a franchisee with Joseph Bank, they stopped selling us franchises. We, we had got secondary, tertiary markets. They took the primary markets. Well, they stopped selling it. So I told my partner, I said, you know, why don't we go to do what the city best off had just sold to Rite Aid? And I realized that he had all this real estate that he was a landlord to when he sold the company. I said, why don't we go back and try to buy our, and be our own landlord? And we did that. And after we did that, uh, we realized that we knew the market that we were already in. So we kind of backfilled and purchased uh, real estate that we thought would make sense in those respective markets. And that's how we got into the real estate market. Um, because for Joseph Bank refused to sell us another franchise. So if, if uh, somebody watching wants to uh, contact you for uh, assistance, I mean, what what type of real estate are you primarily interested in helping them right. with? Right now, I've, and I've only had my license for a few months. My partners have, have had it for a gazillion years. It's something I've always wanted to do. I, I enjoy real estate. So um, I'm at Engels and Velker. And uh, we can post my phone number later in my email. Uh, but I have commercial listings. I have commercial uh, land I have right now out in Metairie. Uh, but residential listings, I'm, I'm thrilled to death to, to go ahead and uh, take a look at as well. And I think part of, part of the thing I love, real estate, like the stock market, in my opinion, are two of the best and most and the safest investments one can make. You know, your primary residence, should never really be thought of as an investment because it's there for your family, your house, you live in. And if you make some money on it, and most people like to make money, that's good. But the investment side of it and the commercial side of it, uh, I've really, it's always intrigued me. Interest rates, um, the ROI on real estate, you know, rate of uh, return on investment, rather. Um, all that has been very uh, interesting to me for years. So I'm very thrilled that I got back into it, even though it's a latter part of my life. One last, uh, one last set of questions, uh, and that's uh, I wanted to talk, uh, ask you about the retail. Mm -hmm. um, so, g generally speaking, if, if I might ask, I mean, how how is retail doing here in Louisiana, um, or is uh, can we do anything better to help retail in Louisiana? Has the internet cut into 
I mean, certainly cut all over the world, but what about Louisiana? Um, all right. So the internet and internet sales, e-commerce, if you will, has affected every company has already really taken their lumps on that and adjusted accordingly. That's that was adjusted years ago. Um, in, in Louisiana retail, uh, bricks and mortar retail, and I'm for those that's having a physical store that you drive to and so on and so forth are doing fairly well uh, in some parts of our uh, our uh, state and some parts not. Uh, demographic shift, and that changes sometimes uh, how retail and bricks and mortar will be received in a certain community. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, unfortunately, um, we got hit downtown New Orleans with a double whammy, crime and COVID. We, our store had been downtown on Coronelette and Gravy for almost 30 years. And we wound up closing it just because people weren't going out. They didn't feel safe shopping. We used to have a lot of the businesses that worked and in, in, uh, in the high rises, One Shell Squares, for instance, or which is now the Hancock Whitney Tower and others, people come by, grab a bite to eat, buy a suit or two. But, you know, um, we had uh, undesirables in and around the area, shootings on different corners, not quite in front of our place, but a half a block down here in front of Rubenstein Brothers. Um, and that dissuades people from coming out. Now, our store on Causeway is doing great. Fantastic. A lot of the customers actually go out of their way to come to us on Causeway, which is nice to see their salespeople. Our store in Mandeville is doing wonderful and other locations we have. But that's how the demographic and the crime situation has affected us and, and other people as well. And, and it's sad because it didn't always have to be that way. The store downtown was our first store we opened in 1992. And that was the one that catapulted us with everything else we've done. Um, so it was disappointing to go through that. But in, in, in the long run, it was the right thing to do was to close. But, you know, hopefully one day, New Orleans will be back and the crime won't be so bad and people feel more comfortable walking around and we can have, there'll be more retail down there. Let's hope so. So uh, next week we have Mark Romig and we also have Vince Vance. Vince Vance has a, a he sent me a, a video. It's exceptional. It's about the New Orleans Saints. So we're going to try to play that on the show and he'll talk about it and maybe he'll talk about his uh, lawsuit that he's got going right, right now. For, Vince uh, Vance and the Valiants are legends, right? Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off, Stephen. My bad. I thought you had finished. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say Vince Vance um, played at our family's uh, amusement park, Pontchartrain Beach, back in the day. Um, and ironically, the fellow that helped me in my campaigns, Sid Arroyo, was one of the members of the, and it was a Valiant and toured. These guys opened up for some of the best acts in the day, uh, big time headliners. And uh, I'm glad he's still out there and having fun because yeah, he's yeah. a character. He is a character. He is a character. So, Jay, back, listen, we finished the first show. Boy, today, the day from hell in terms of technology. And, uh, but, you know, got through, got through it, had a great conversation with you. And uh, those people watching, please go ahead and tell your friends. Please share the video. I'll, I'm going to be putting out some excerpts. Uh, some cuts, snippets, etc., of uh, the best of uh, the best of bat. <laughs> oh, gee! Oh my goodness! <laughs> the bat best. You know, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, listen. Thank you so much. I do appreciate. I uh, really do. Uh, for those people watching, thank you again. Please go ahead and hit that share button. We'd love to see you again next Tuesday at seven o'clock. Uh, and uh, you have any anything further that you want to say? No, I just want to apologize to all the viewers and people that uh, chimed in. And we look forward to doing this next week and the weeks to come. Uh, we'll definitely have the uh, technology issues ironed out. And uh, I had a lot of fun, even though we had to pair it back without Lawrence. But um, I hope to see everybody next week. Absolutely. Take care. Uh, if you don't mind, just stay on for a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it for everybody else. Sure. Uh, Good night, everybody. Bye.